Hi, this is Dr. Brooke Patterson, and this lecture is on the musculoskeletal system. It is so imperative to conduct a thorough health history on the musculoskeletal system because the presenting symptoms may indicate underlying pathologic conditions. Common or concerning symptoms in the musculoskeletal history include joint pain, especially joint pain associated with symptoms such as fever, chills, rashes, weakness, and or weight loss. Some examples of autoimmune diseases that also have musculoskeletal manifestations are lupus, psoriatic arthritis, and polymyalgia rheumatica, also known as PMR. Lower back pain, especially when accompanied with costovertebral angle tenderness, or CVA tenderness, could indicate pyelonephritis or nephrolithiasis. Other causes that could potentially indicate an underlying issue is neck pain which could mean meningitis. Muscle pain and or cramping may equate to anything as simple as overexertion with exercise to electrolyte abnormalities, thyroid disease, or even side effects of medications such as statins. Muscle weakness, specifically unilateral weakness, is especially concerning and could be indicative of a CVA. Although your book goes into great detail regarding each joint, the types of joints and connections, and the different assessments and maneuvers to evaluate muscle strength and range of motion, you will be looking for the same things regarding inspection and palpation. You will start with examining the joint for symmetry, if applicable, alignment, and any bony deformities or deformities of surrounding tissues, erythema, and or discoloration. You will then palpate the surrounding tissues for any skin changes, nodules, crepitus, or warmth. You can inspect and palpate for any edema. If edema, erythema, possible pain, and or, or warmth are noted, it is possible that an infection, gout, and or an inflammatory condition is present. Usually, there is a, when there is a systemic condition present, you will more than likely see bilateral in, involvement as opposed to unilateral. You will then move to the assessment of muscle strength and range of motion. You will start by evaluating active range of motion if the patient is able, but if weakness is present, then it may be only applicable to do passive range of motion. There are a few hindrances to active and passive range of motion, including, in, but not limited to, muscular atrophy, weakness, decreased sensation, neurologic conditions, pain, joint stiffness, and or contractures. We will review several of the major joints in this presentation, but there is a more conclusive review in your readings. When thinking about muscle strength, you will use a scale from zero to five, with zero being no muscular contraction detected, to a five where active movement against full resistance without evident fatigue or normal muscular strength is present. Considerations for the scale include variables such as age, sex, musculoskeletal training, and also being cognizant of the dominant side that will usually be stronger. You will also document any paralysis if present in one or both extremities. The next several slides include a comprehensive assessment of range of motion for the shoulder. The picture on the left represents shoulder flexion and patient instructions would include simply stating to raise your arms in front of you and overhead. Another example on the right is hyperextension. You would just ask the patient to raise your arms behind you. On the left side, we have abduction of the shoulder and the right side, you have adduction. One very common musculoskeletal complaint of the shoulder that you may encounter is rotator cuff tendonitis and tears. In these scenarios, the patient will have difficulty shrugging their shoulders and abduction will be limited. The wrist and hands are complex units of small, highly active joints used almost continuously during waking hours with little protection and increased vulnerability to trauma and disability. Be familiar with the distal interphalangeal joints or DIP, proximal interphalangeal joints or PIPs, and metacarpal phalangeal joints, also known as MCPs, because these are often the locations you may find possible acute or chronic changes that may indicate rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, and or possible gout. 
One common issue is carpal tunnel syndrome. I wanted to show you this picture of the medial nerve and how it runs under the flexor retinaculum, aka the carpal tunnel. These two tests, the two tests that are most often used to confirm carpal tunnel syndrome are the Phelan's and Tennell's test. These exams are most commonly performed by advanced practice providers, but I want you to be familiar with them as they are commonly seen in primary care. Here's a question for you. It asks, match the following types of arthritis with their etiologies. One, osteoarthritis. Two, rheumatoid. Three, gouty arthritis. And the potential answers are A, metabolic, B, degenerative, or C, autoimmune. For the answer, number one, osteoarthritis is linked to a de degenerative condition, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune condition, and gouty arthritis is a metabolic process or condition. Inspection of the spine can begin as soon as the patient is walking into the room. You start to notice a patient's posture, the position of the neck and trunk, position of the head, and coordination of gait. You will inspect the spine from both the lateral and posterior positions. Specifically, the dive test that we practice in lab can reveal a curvature of the spine known as scoliosis. When we assess the spine from the lateral view, we can start to think about the different postures. Kyphosis and lordosis, if present, can be observed from the lateral view. Lower back pain is a common complaint and, as we mentioned earlier, can yield very different etiologies. A few examples we mentioned are pyelonephritis and nephrolithiasis, in which you may have CVA tenderness and possibly a fever if infection is present. As you go a little bit lower and more midline to the spine, you may encounter sacroiliac joint pain or tenderness. Many times, sacroiliac joint dysfunction can cause irritability in the sciatic nerve and can lead to pain and potential numbness and tingling that radiates down the leg of the affected side. This question asks, scoliosis is a malate curvature of the spine. A, kyphotic, B, lordotic, or C, lateral? The answer is C, lateral. Scoliosis is a lateral curvature of the spine, usually in the thoracic vertebral column. With the hip, you can check for active and passive range of motion with extension, abduction, and adduction. While supine, you can also check for a straight leg raise, which if positive is indicative of a disc herniation. With the patient supine, you can also check for external and internal rotation. However, be especially careful with your geriatric patients as this can elicit extensive pain with movement, so it is imperative to pay close attention to those nonverbal and verbal communication measures from your patient. The total weight of, bo of your body is transmitted through the ankle and the foot and it absorbs the impact of a heel strike and gait. These are frequent sites of sprain and strain and bone injuries. You will inspect all surfaces, checking for deformities, nodules, edema, calluses, and corns, which can be common, which can also be common areas of infection. Also, it is very important for you to inspect the bottoms of the feet, especially in your diabetic patients, where peripheral neuropathy may manifest. The patient without sensation or decreased sensation may be totally unaware of any skin breakdown. This is why it is so important for diabetic patients to get regular foot exams and monofilament testing. Also remember back to the peripheral vascular lecture and think about peripheral artery disease and the descriptions of an arterial ulcer. A popular location for initial, an initial gout flare is the great toe. After inspection and palpation, you will then move to range of motion of the ankle and foot. Range of motion includes inversion and eversion. In addition to grip strength, you can also test muscle strength by both plantar flexion and dorsiflexion against the resistance of the examiner. These are a few examples of abnormalities of the toes and soles. The first being an ingrown toenail, which can possibly lead to a paronychia and or infection. Another example is a hammer toe, which is most commonly present in the second toe. The bottom are examples of friction related problems, including corns and calluses. This question asks, a hammer toe deformity most often involves the A, great toe, B, second toe, C, third toe, D, fourth toe, or E, fifth toe? The answer is B, second toe. 
Health promotion topics include nutrition and the proper intake of electrolytes, exercise and weight bearing activities, and low back pain prevention. Prevention for low back pain includes education on posture, appropriate body mecha mechanics for lifting, and exercises to strengthen lower back and stretching. Fall prevention can be addressed by assessing risk factors, which are both cognitive and physiologic, such as unstable gait, imbalanced posture, impaired mobility, AMS or cognitive deficits, and medication side effects for those affecting blood pressure or that could cause orthos orthostatic hypotension and incontinence. I also wanted to mention the importance of osteoporosis screening and prevention, which is a common U.S. health problem. We can encourage adequate calcium and vitamin D intake. Although you will probably go through these in pharmacology, I did want to mention that specific medications are significant contributors to osteoporosis. One common contributor is oral, oral or high-dose inhaled corticosteroids. Also, recent studies have concluded that long-term proton pump inhibitor use can also increase the risk of osteoporosis. And this concludes our lecture on the musculoskeletal system.